Good morning, everybody. My name is Jenny Williams, and I'm the Deputy Director of Government Affairs here at the Austin Board of Realtors. I've got a few housekeeping items before we start today's program. For this event, ABOR on Air is using Zoom webinar, Zoom's webinar pro platform. It's slightly different than Zoom meetings that you're probably used to. Your webcams and microphones have been disabled so that we can optimize audio and video quality. Um, Today's program will also be recorded for internal purposes and portions of today's program may be available for viewing afterward. Um, we also will be taking questions from the audience, so feel free to add your questions in the chat box. You'll see that down at the bottom of your screen um, and uh, we will get to as many as we can. We know that there's many questions out there. Um, to kick off our discussion today, please let me welcome our ABOR CEO, Emily Chenevere, to um, offer some welcoming remarks. All right, good morning. Thanks, Jenny. Welcome to our special election program, Project Connect, Community Investment or Costly Burden. This November, uh, voters across the city will not only be participating in one of the most watched presidential elections in history, but Austinites will also be deciding whether or not to support an 8.75 cent tax increase for the Project Connect transit plan. This has been a conversation long time coming and we're excited that we've brought together two local leaders rep representing both sides of this issue to allow you to be fully informed before you enter the voting booth. Supporters say Austin is long overdue for a modernized public transit system and that Prop A is a community investment for our future. Opponents might say that Prop A is a costly burden to property owners and that now is not the time to be increasing property taxes. Today, this panel will explore both sides of the issue and ensure that you've got a full perspective on what Prop A means for Central Texas. I want to again thank you for joining us, let you know that ABOR is here to be this type of resource for you throughout the election cycle. And Jenny, I'll invite you to help us get started. Thanks, Emily. Before we dive into our robust discussion, let me introduce our two panelists today. First, Honorable, the Honorable Gerald Darty. Gerald Darty serves as Travis County Commissioner for Precinct 3. He returned to the commissioners, he was elected to Travis County Commissioner's Court in 2002 and has served um, until 2008. He returned to the court in January 2013 and continues to work to keep county taxes at bay and to shape the future transportation pro projects for the Travis County area. For the past 40 years, Commissioner Darty has been a successful Austin businessman, owning and operating successful ventures, including the Pleasant Valley Sportsplex and three Jack Allen's Kitchens restaurants. Um, our other panelist today is John Michael Cortez. John Michael serves as special assistant to the mayor of Austin. He advises Mayor Adler on Austin's most challenging issues, including regional and urban planning, transportation, workforce development, and affordable housing. He's got his plate full for sure. In the, his time working for Mayor Adler, John Michael has facilitated the development of Austin's largest ever multimodal transportation bond program, which voters approved and is now transforming how Austinites move around our city. His current focus is the rewrite of Austin's 35-year-old land development code and preparing the Austin community to finally invest in the um, regional high capacity transit system. Welcome to both of you. Um, so first, we just want to hear from both of you about your perspective on um, Project Connect um, and the ballot issue at hand. So um, we've got three minutes for each of you. John Michael, we'll start with you. Okay, thank you. And uh, thanks uh, again to the Board of Realtors for inviting Commissioner Doherty and I to be here today. This is obviously a, a critical issue uh, in front of all of us uh, for this momentous election. Uh, and I think uh, Emily said it well. I mean, I, I'm really excited about this because this is a long overdue opportunity. Long overdue for transformational change in our city. Uh, Proposition A would help fund Project Connect, which is a plan for a citywide rapid transit system for all of our uh, uh, residents here in Austin. It's the result of several years of community input from tens of thousands of people and organizations over the last few years, including the Board of Realtors. Uh, it includes three new high-tech electric light rail lines that would serve the uh, University of Texas campus, downtown, of course, South Congress, North Lamar, East Riverside, 
out to the airport and, and several other parts of the city. It includes a new downtown transit tunnel, which would allow transit to run quickly and safely beneath our most congested streets. It includes a new commuter rail line from downtown east out to Maynard. Uh, improvements to the existing uh, metro rail line, including new stations near the domain and our new professional soccer team stadium. It includes uh, several new metro rapid bus lines serving major corridors, including Maynard Road, Airport, Pleasant Valley, and Menchaca, among others. Includes many new park and rides around the edges of our city, which will be served by express buses and metro rapid lines running in managed lanes, uh, like we see on North Mopac. Uh, it has over a dozen new on-demand neighborhood circulators, improvements to our existing bus service, improvements to transit technology for seamless trip planning and payment. And it also includes $300 million for investments in affordability and gentrification uh, around uh, transit. That's a lot. Uh, this system is big and it is bold because it has to be. It has to be that big and bold to overcome years of inaction on mobility of this type. It has to be bold because it is a solution that's finally being proposed that's actually at the scale of the challenges facing our city. Voting for Proposition A and Project Connect is the most important thing we can do right now to ease traffic congestion. Voting for Prop A is the most important thing we can do locally to fight against the global existential threat of climate change. It is the most important thing we can do to serve all those essential workers, those folks who work at HEB, those nurses, those uh, healthcare workers who we're all coming to recognize and appreciate more during this pandemic and who disproportionately rely on transit to get to their jobs that keep us all in our economy going. It's the most important thing we can do for equity and affordability in our city, two of our longstanding challenges. Voting for Prop A is also perhaps the most important thing we can do to fight against the tragic and needless carnage of traffic related deaths and fatalities that are inflicted upon our residents every year. And finally, voting for Prop A is probably the most important thing we can do in this city to recover from this pandemic recession more prosperous, more equitable, and stronger than this city was before we went into the pandemic. So I'm obviously a big supporter and excited about Proposition A. Uh, those are just a few of the reasons why I hope uh, all of you join me in supporting this effort. Now I would say that uh, there is an opposition, of course, to Proposition A, and those who have been leading the charge for it, uh, you know, including uh, Commissioner Doherty, uh, have been leading the charge against these kinds of investments for a while. Uh, and quite frankly, using the same arguments uh, for years. There are no new arguments. They're just mo more misleading this time. Uh, there's misleading information out there about the tax impact of property. Thank you, John Michael. We're going to move uh, the on. Mobility to impact, et cetera. So I look forward to covering all those issues in detail. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. So to you, Commissioner Doherty, um, you know, John Michael mentioned that Proposition A has a, a lot of stuff in it. Um, obviously, you're on the um, opposition side. So what do you feel is lacking? Go ahead and give us your um, three minute intro and pitch. Uh, Jenny, um, uh, like Michael, John Michael, uh, thank you very much for you and Abor and Emily for you know, setting this thing up and giving us the opportunity to do this because it is so, so important. Um, it, it is um, always a little interesting uh, to continue to hear that, you know, I, I've got the same old ideas. I mean, I've got the same old issues with, um, with, uh, with transit and, and particularly um, light rail, um, guilty. I mean, um, I do have some of the same issues that I've, that I've always had. Um, but, you know, I am, I'm a businessman. I'm a small businessman. Uh, I predicate uh, everything on what I do, be it Jack Allen's, or making decisions at the commissioner's court um, on uh, empirical evidence of what I know uh, has happened. And I usually use that to extrapolate where I think I need to go with decisions <clears throat> going forward. You know, when you, when you hear about uh, equity and affordability, uh, and I know we're going to have a, an opportunity here in a second to talk about, you know, this increased tax uh, that would be necessitated if $7.1 billion gets, um, <clears throat> gets passed. Uh, there is nothing equitable and affordable about a city of Austin 
property tax of 24.5%. That 24.5% is the 3.5% that the city council has already voted to extend uh, for this year. And if you pass the eight and three quarter cents, it's uh, another 20%. So we can, we can argue with that. I mean, but there's really no use arguing. It was printed in the paper. So when I get challenged on that, I just bring out, I said, this is what the city of Austin printed in the paper because they had to. So we, hopefully we won't have to uh, be a dead horse about that. Let me, let me say that <clears throat> I am really um, a, a very frugal minded decision maker. Um, in the last couple of months, I, I found it, you know, uh, encouraging that, um, that Emily wrote the piece, the editorial piece in the paper, talking about pleading with us, the county and all the other taxing entities, to please not raise your taxes. Because affordability is something that has really left the station, so to speak, for lack of a better way to put it. Uh, we all know how difficult it is to continue to live in this community, and it is going to become even more so if people get duped into signing off on a $7.1 billion transit plan. What you need to know about transit is transit has been, Capital Metro has been in existence for 35 years. They started in 1985 when we voted it into existence. And I voted for the creation of Capital Metro. When people say, well, I mean, you just don't like transit. Not true. I mean, I voted for it then. I voted for it for the right reason. It is still needed. What I have a problem with is a continuation of the Capital Metro board, probably not so much the administration, I mean, All right, Commissioner. Uh, I'm going to cut you off so that we stick to our time frame. I appreciate you. You know that. And and but everybody, this is just to keep us fair and honest. But John Michael, let me let me turn back to you for a minute on the price tag. Um, some are saying that it's a five percent increase. Some are saying it's a twenty percent increase. I think there's even confusion about why this is a permanent TRE versus a bond. Is one of the questions that came from our chat, and people want to know: Is this a permanent tax increase, a forever increase in the cost of homeownership in Austin, or is it a temporary increase? Can you address some of that for us? Sure, I can, and thank you for the opportunity. So uh, the, act, the answer is: it's it's neither a twenty-five percent tax increase or a five percent tax increase. It's about a four percent tax increase. So when you hear uh, figures put out like 20, 25 percent. Uh, you know, uh, increase to the city of Austin's tax rate. It's one of those things where it's true, but it's misleading because when I pay my property taxes, I don't know about you all, but I assume it's the same, which most of us, I, I pay out of escrow. They cut one check to the tax assessor collector. Those of you who pay uh, driving down to the tax office, you cut one check for your entire tax bill, which includes the bill from not just the city, but the school district, Travis County, uh, Commissioner's Court, which uh, Commissioner Doherty sits on, ACC, et cetera. What most people are concerned about <clears throat> is what is my total tax bill? And the reality is, is that this proposition represents about a 4% increase on the median homeowner's tax bill, right? So 25% is a very misleading number. It is a 4% increase in the check you would have to write to Bruce Elfand if you live in, in Travis County. It's <clears throat> to about, you know, around 280 bucks per year uh, on the median household or 79 cents a day. And for 79 cents a day, you get big impacts in traffic and our fight against climate change in equity and affordability in traffic safety, all the things. <clears throat> we That's what it costs not some misleading overinflated number. It is 4% or 79 cents per day on the, on the median homeowner. The reason, okay, so oh, excuse me, go ahead. Oh, the reason why we're proposing a tax rate election instead of a bond. And, and it, quite frankly, uh, I, you, know, I, you know, Commissioner Doherty mentioned that he's frugal. I think this is a very frugal proposition. Were we to do this system with a bond, it would be much, much more expensive. 
the way, the, the, the way that we're proposing to fund this actually results in a lower price tag by hundreds of millions of dollars. What it also does is ensure that we don't repeat the mistakes that have been made in other cities who have embarked upon a transit program, where they ask the voters, hey, give us a bunch of money to build it. Oops, we forgot to ask you for the money to operate it and maintain it. And then it falls apart in 30 years and we have to go back. We're asking you one time for enough money to be able to build it, to operate it frequently uh, all day, uh, keep it clean, keep it running, and, and keep it up to date and repair it as it needs to be and replace it as it needs to be in perpetuity. Got it. Thanks so much. And before I move to Commissioner Dougherty and ask him to respond to that, just to provide adequate context for our membership, because they work in a market that they see price and value um, rising so rapidly, it's important to understand that that median impact that you're talking about is on the basis of appraised value per Travis County appraisal district's values assessed in, across the county, not market value, which we know is dramatically rising, which will eventually cause TCAD to have to catch up. Gerald Darty, you wanna hop in there? <laughs> well, <clears throat> the city of Austin published in the paper August the 7th, the tax increase, the city of Austin tax increase from going from around 43 to 44 cents to 53 cents. That alone is a 20% property tax increase. It was in the paper in black and white. I mean, this is not some number that I pulled out of the air. I mean, John Michael, I guess I can send you that thing over so you can see what you all published. Everybody understands that you get one tax bill. What I am saying and what the group that I represent are saying is that this is the largest tax increase ever. And what you didn't answer, John Michael, is this is for every year. When you take the eight and three quarter cents next year, it's the same eight and three quarter cents. It does not go back to the 44 cents it stays then at the 53 cents. And with increased valuations, it continues to go up. This is the gift that never keeps giving, that never stops. I mean, it is with us from this point forward. And all of the things, Emily, that people are saying that you're gonna get, look at the history of public transit ridership. Public transit ridership in 1990 was 31 million boardings. In 2019, it was 31 million boardings. 30 years later, after having spent $4.4 billion of the penny sales tax, you would think that somebody could grow public ridership numbers. This is not Capital Metro's fault. This, I'm not throwing rocks at the organization, you just can't get people out of their cars. The 3.6 to 4% of the people that use public transit in this community, and that's about what the number is. It's about, you know, a little less than 4% of the people use it. That's very important to them. But if you are going to move forward on starting, starting, this is an initial investment, 7.1 billion. That is a key word in all of this. You are talking about starting a system where you're gonna to continue to need more and more and more public dollars in order to operate what? I mean, most of this $7.1 billion is the two rail lines. The two rail lines may, may carry 1% of the travelers in this community. And that is predicated on if you just go and look at the red line. There is a red, there is a light rail line. It carries 1,500 people, 3,000 boardings in a population of 1,200,000 people. There is no indication that we are growing public transit. You know what's growing? You know what's keeping people off of the road? Telework. And we've really witnessed it during this pandemic. Please, and Gerald, you've helped us. 
just tee up the next question um, and we'll throw this one to you first. Um, as you mentioned, we're in um, a global pandemic. Um, the, the way we're living our lives has totally changed um, and people are also um, dealing with some financial crises. Um, so is now, uh, in, from your perspective, Gerald, um, and then we'll throw it to John Michael to respond, is now the right time to be um, proposing such an increase on um, homeowners and uh, citizens of Austin during this interesting time? So Gerald, we'll start with you. Jenny, absolutely not. I mean, everyone is trying to figure out whether they're even going to have a job next year. We all are told, and I think most of us believe, we're in this for another six, nine to 12 months. I mean, there are iconic businesses closing. There are people hanging on by their fingertips. There is no indication whatsoever that the light at the end of the tunnel is anything other than unfortunately perhaps a freight train. You do not embark on a major expense like this when you really can't even really justify. Everything is wishful and hopeful thoughts that people are miraculously going to start using something that for 30 years they haven't grown the ridership with. So um, why in the world would anybody think that you should start with a $7.1 billion plan that will raise your city taxes, your city of Austin taxes by 20% along with the 3.5% that they've already added on. This is, I mean, this is amazing when they try to take me on about this when it's in black and white. There is no indication that public transit is the fix to traffic. If had we grown ridership in 30 years, y'all, perhaps. I mean, it's flat at best. It's flat all over the country at best. Most of your public transit ridership is in the Northeast. And why? Because you can't physically take a car to a lot, to a lot of places. And it is a way of life and you have huge densities. We don't have huge densities here. We don't want huge densities here. The Austin Neighborhood Council has fought the city of Austin for the last number of years because they don't want to densify. Those are the kind of things that the city wants to have happen. And quite frankly, I mean, um, I think that that's an interesting subject that we can talk about. And I think it's a little bit further down uh, the list of questions. But uh, seven point, starting with a $7.1 billion, assuming that somebody is gonna use something that they have not in history in 30 years have shown that there is increased ridership, that's lunacy as far as I'm concerned. I would never make those decisions as a, an elected official. I certainly would never make those decisions as a business person. Thank you, Gerald. Um, so, John Michael, um, your response to that, but then also can you speak to, you mentioned that, um, uh, proponents of Project Connect are um, believing, are supporting the idea that this will help bring us out of the, the pandemic uh, economic crisis we're in. So can you touch on both of those things? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, before I do, I just want to, again, just redirect some things that have been misdirected. Uh, the commissioner's correct. This is a $7.1 billion plan, uh, but we're not asking the taxpayers for $7.1 billion. The capital cost of this plan, 7.1 billion, 45% of it, uh, at least, uh, will be paid for by the federal government, the Federal Transit Administration. Capital Metro is also contributing uh, sales taxes uh, in, on the order of tens of millions of dollars a year to help offset some more of the capital and the operational costs. This, what we're asking for is a tax rate election for the city of Austin share of this system that will serve our entire city. Uh, so I just wanted to make sure, you know, he's very careful to say $7.1 billion system, but that's not actually what you're being asked for today. Um, another thing that needs to be corrected, uh, ridership uh, has increased uh, in the parts of the city where transit actually is. One of the numbers that gets thrown around a lot for years, that's a little misleading, is based on uh, transit ridership in the five county area, the metro area. Well, guess what the transit ridership is in Hutto? Guess what it is in San Marcos? Guess what it is in Lockhart? Almost zero, do you know why? Because there's no transit there. 
Much more appropriate would be to look at what is the ridership where the transit actually is. And you will find in this community that there are census tracts looking at the uh, most recent American Community Survey data in 2018, where you have one out of four people who use transit to get to work. Uh, many neighborhoods uh, that are served by transit where you have five, 10, 15% of the people using transit regularly to get to work. Again, you know, what did Mark Twain say? There's, there's lies, damn lies, and statistics. You know, there, we need to be very careful about how we use numbers. When I hear Commissioner Doherty and others say that, well, only 1% or 4% of the region is using transit, all that tells me is we need to be investing in a hell of a lot more transit because it's the only way that we're gonna make a meaningful impact in addressing all of the challenges that we envision Project Connect to address. Now with respect, is this the right time? You know, no, you know why? Because we should have started 20 years ago, right? What do they say, the, the, best, the best time to have planted a tree was 20 years ago, the next best time is today. I wish we would have started 20 years ago, but for folks like Commissioner Doherty, we may have started 20 years ago when it was a lot more, uh, a lot more affordable, but we're living in reality and there is no more important time for us to be investing in a system that's going to achieve all the Project Connect system is going to, to address the challenges in our city. If there's few lessons that we have to come out of this pandemic with, it's that we have done a terrible job of addressing disparities in our country and in our community. We need to make investments on this level to be able to make an actual impact in those disparities. If there's any lesson that we've learned starting from the Great Depression, uh, subsequent depressions and recessions, the 2008, the Great Recession, is that now is not the time to say, well, we, we shouldn't be investing in our community. We have to double down and invest in our community. Project Connect will create tens of thousands of well-paying jobs in our community. Never mind the fact that it will create an avenue for people who have to work for a living who don't have the option to work from home. And I gotta say that a huge chunk, disproportionately large share of the employment of those folks who are essential frontline workers who don't have the luxury of working from home are using transit to get to their jobs. And we need to serve them. We, we owe it to them and all that they've done in this pandemic to improve their service, which Project Connect will do. So uh, the answer to your question is, there has been no more, there is no more important time for us to make these investments, although I wish we would have done it 20 years ago. Thanks, John Michael. Um, I appreciate you kind of providing that context. I think we ought to talk a little bit about trust because to your point, it, it is not the city of Austin taxpayers that will fund the entire cost of the project, right? So there's, you know, how much security should taxpayers have in, in feeling confident that the feds are gonna make the match is one question. There's another question from the chat related to Cat Metro's um, you know, background and, and, and track record. How confident do we feel in the relationship between both the city of Austin and Cat Metro that this can be managed properly and that the funds will be used in support of the actual transit project? And I know that with that, you can speak a little bit to the intergovernmental local agreement that will be just decided upon as well. Great questions, great questions. Uh, with respect to the, again, 45% of the capital cost of construction of that $7.1 billion numbers, we expect to come from the Federal Transit Administration. Uh, we are very secure uh, and very confident that that will come true. Actually, we're starting to see uh, cities who are proposing projects like uh, Project Connect get close to 50% of the cost being funded by the Federal Transit Administration. Uh, uh, some of our peer cities around the country uh, received those grants just last year. Uh, there's always the, the claim that, well, uh, you know, the federal government's not going to fund those anymore. Hogwash. Uh, President Trump, I think just yesterday, signed a continuing resolution that put billions more dollars in the capital investment grants program. And the sad part is because we've waited so long to make these investments, when these projects get rated, Austin rates off the chart because we, we haven't had these investments. We have terrible traffic. We have terrible inequities. Uh, uh, in our city. And so when the federal government actually scores these projects, guess what? We come up pretty high because we are so far behind. Uh, uh, you know, we're, we're certain to get that level of investment from the Federal Transit Administration. Uh, secondly, you know, what kind of security, what kind of trust uh, should people feel that these monies are going to be spent correctly? You know, recognizing that and recognizing that this is a long-term investment. This is a 10, 20, 30-year program we're embarking on. The Capital Metro Board, 
uh, the, the city council, uh, major stakeholders like the Chamber of Commerce, RECA and ABOR have demanded that there be an independent oversight body that actually receives these funds. Uh, it's called the Austin Transit Partnership, which is a separate local government corporation that will receive these funds, will receive federal funds, and will receive contributions from Capital Metro, and it will have an independent appointed board that will oversee the, the, the design, the implementation, the contracting, uh, to make sure that these monies are spent exactly the way uh, that they're intended to. But we have belts and suspenders, right? So not only do we have the, the ordinance and the proposition, when the voters vote on this, they are locking the city in uh, per the state statutes to spend the money on these purposes. But beyond that, we have a contract with the voters that is a legally binding and enforceable document between capital, excuse me, between the city of Austin and our voters. Beyond that, we'll have a joint powers agreement. Beyond that, we'll have full funding grant agreements with the federal Transit administration for that for that will lock us in if we want to get that 45 to 50 percent of federal funding. We have all the belts and suspenders you could possibly want to ensure. And you know, last but not least, if for some reason, and I don't think this is even possible, we could, you know, some future city council or cap metro board wanted to figure out a way around, I am quite sure that the keen eye of ABOR, the Chamber of Commerce, and other stakeholder groups would slap their hand. Say, wait a minute, we have all these legally enforcing documents that would prevent you from doing that. So I, I think that the voters should be very secure that these monies will spent in the most transparent <clears throat> way of any major capital program in the history of this city. Well, I appreciate your confidence that Avor will be a watchdog as we tend to be, but um, Commissioner Doherty, why don't I turn to you? How do you feel in terms of confidence related to the match that's expected from the feds and the relationship that's required to manage this properly locally? Let me take you back to the red line. Um, the red line back in uh, 2006 was um, told that it was gonna be a $90 million project. Half of it was gonna come from the feds. Um, Cap Metro didn't even apply for the federal dollars at the time because they knew that they couldn't comply with the new starts program. So they got nothing. The $90 million project uh, red lined, um, swelled to beyond $120 million. Um, the operational cost was supposed to have been somewhere between what was uh, uh, said to be somewhere between three and perhaps four to $5 million. Uh, what happened with the red line? The red line uh, is barely reaching any sort of numbers that they talked about that they would get um, you know, within 10 years. Well, as a matter of fact, they're nowhere near what they said they were going to get. Uh, they didn't get 50% of the money back then. I don't think they're going to get 45% of the money now. I think the, 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 the FTA is hemorrhaging right now from dollars that are needed, and especially for the Northeast. The Northeast is where 50% of public transit ridership exists in the United States. They are old, they are crumbling. That's where you put those dollars. But hey, the big question here is, so you get 45, I don't know that they'll get it. I don't think that they'll get it. Even if they do get it, you're still gonna pay higher taxes. They're still gonna collect the eight and three quarter cent every year. It's still going to be cost prohibitive for the average everyday person. This tax increase is so regressive. I mean, when they want to talk about equity and affordability and helping people that really need to be helped, if Capital Metro did the job that they were supposed to do when they were created, they would take their penny sales tax and they would run the most robust bus company that you can run in Austin, Texas. That is what we voted for. A dedicated penny of sales, like that is our total discretionary penny that we gave all to Capital Metro, y'all. And just that penny alone has generated over $4 billion. And I would ask people, do they think that when they see buses up and down the street, are they full? Are they hanging out the windows? No. Are there some full buses? Yes, at certain times of the day. But y'all, 
the problem that Cap Metro has is they've never kept their eye on the ball for doing the basic service that we voted them into existence with in 1985. They have had an insatiable appetite for doing this crazy rail stuff, which does not pencil out at all. Uh, most of your riders on rail, if you know anything about transit, are borrowed riders. Borrowed riders mean that they come from buses. I mean, why are you building an expensive program that's hundreds of million dollars of mile. Let's not even talk about the tunnel. I mean, we have no idea what that thing is going to cost, but there is no indication that we should trust them. And, and, I, and I will tell you, if you just ask the average everyday person up and down the street, is the city of Austin in its present state, are they a trusted entity? I hate to say it, but most people will say, no, I don't trust them. In this new uh, Austin Transit program, uh, the LGC, a local government, you know, uh, uh, code that is allowed. I mean, what is transparent about that? I mean, Randy Clark is supposedly supposed to be the chairman of that. Randy Clark is the president and CEO of Cap Metro. This is not the fox watching the hen house. This is the fox in the hen house. Y'all, I mean, I, I would like to say that I, that I trust them. Do I, that's not, no, I don't trust them. Am I saying that I don't like the people? No, I'm not saying that I don't like the people. I mean, you know, I like John Michael. I mean, he's just on a different side from me. I like the like mayor on a different side from me. I mean, and, and that's where we are, but as far as trust in this community, you just ask the average everyday person if the city of Austin or if Capital Metro are trusted entities, and I, I bet you that you would find that most people go, the last few years I've had a really difficult time. Ask Austin Neighborhood Council, do they trust the city of Austin? Even when they lose lawsuits, they come back at you with a different name of what they want to do. I'm, I'm suspicious about what the city of Austin is doing within a number of areas, but I will tell you that thinking that transit is going to get us out of a transportation woe, um, and I do think that we will get back to having more traffic than we want. I do think that a lot of people will come back to work, but I also think a lot of people are not gonna come back to work. I think that they're gonna telecommute and I think that most people know that. So before we embark on this kind of an expense from this point forward, this point forward, which is what this thing is doing, then I think we ought to think long and hard about this whole project. So very good points, uh, Commissioner um, and John Michael. Um, so you actually set us up perfectly, Commissioner. Y'all are doing such a great job of doing that. Um, we've had some questions in the chat, but we also prepared to ask about this. We'll start with the commissioner on this question. Um, so what about transit versus roadway infrastructure? So, or rubber tire um, transit that can be, you know, pivoted and changed. Um, from your point of view, uh, Commissioner, why are roads and rubber tire transit better than, uh, trains, et cetera, and then we'll throw to John Michael um, to offer his point of view. And, and let me add this from the chat just to give further context. If not this project, then what? I think is a, a fair question that came from our chat. Yeah. So Commissioner, we'll start with you. The rubber tire is the most flexible mode of transportation that you can have, period. If you guess something wrong uh, with a rubber tire system, guess what? You change a pattern, you change uh, uh, the lines. Um, the, the, the red line, part of what propped the red line up, y'all, is because they said that they were going to take the express buses out of the Northwest so that you'd have the ridership on the trains. And for about six months, that worked. And then people determined that the train is more expensive, the train is not as flexible, the train makes me have to do. Uh, different connections, transfers, 
it gets you to so few of places, unless of course you have the densities like you have in the Northeast, which we don't, and we probably never will. Um, the rubber tire system is the best system that we could have. The unfortunate thing about our rubber tire system is that it has to use our inadequate road system. And whenever you have an inadequate road system, your buses have a more difficult time using those. I mean, if you do these rail lines, not only are you going to totally disrupt an already inadequate road system, you're gonna take lanes out in a lot of places um, and you're gonna create more traffic. Um, and, and that's just the truth. That's, uh, that, that is the way that it works. And everybody knows that. I mean, because all you have to do is open your eyes and look. If you had something more than 4% of the people that use transit, if you could see that thing growing, not some inconsequential, you know, number. I mean, the, the, hey, the biggest bump that Capital Metro has gotten in the last year, two years, is because the express buses, more people have gotten on the express buses. Why? Because of the managed lane on Mopac because they can get on that managed lane in the bus. Those are the things that we need to work on, where we work with the RMA, where we work with TxDOT, where we really concentrate on making sure that you have an adequate road system so that your transit can work better, so that your emergency vehicles can work better. The, the whole community benefits from that. But if you're gonna suck money out of this system on wishful thinking about fixed guideway, which is really rail, that is really a very dangerous path to go down. Um, and so that's the reason I feel it. Great, thank you for that. Um, John Michael, um, what about your perspective? Well, you know, quite frankly, there's a lot that I agree with uh, Commissioner Doherty, uh, you know, what he just said. Uh, in, in many respects, in many situations, rubber tire transit uh, is the best solution. And that's why there's a whole heck of a lot of additional investments in rubber tire transit as part of Project Connect. All those metro rapid lines, all the improvements to fixed route bus service, uh, the neighborhood circulators, those are rubber tire investments. You know, there's a fixation on the rail component, you know, the, you know, appropriately so. The rail component was proposed on those corridors where the bus ridership is so high that we simply cannot serve it with buses. Uh, and, and remember folks, you know, it, it, you know, there's a lot of anecdotal examples being tossed around here. This system is, is going to serve us today, but it also has to be a system that works for us for 20, 30 years down the road. And when you look at the fact that this community is gonna grow from about 2 million to 4 million in the next 20 years, we're not building for 2 million, we're building for a community of 4 million because that would be the responsible, prudent thing to do. And the corridors where rail is proposed are those where the travel demand is so high that if we were to try to serve it with buses, we would, it would not work at all. And so, yes, we're putting rubber tire where rubber tire makes the most sense, including more of those great lines that the commissioner mentioned, like the, the express buses working with the RMA and those express lanes. Uh, we propose to do that on South Mopac once the Mobility Authority gets green lighted to do that. North 183, uh, uh, we'll run buses on, on 290. We'll run buses on the Bergstrom Expressway on IH35 once that gets done. And speaking of those roads, let me just dispel everything of another kind of misleading tactic against transit. They always set up this straw man argument, like we shouldn't do transit, we should be doing roads. And that is absolutely ridiculous. The reality is, is, is I'm sure most, I bet the commissioner would agree with this, we need to do all of it. We need it all. And the reality is we are doing it all, save and except for the major investments that we hope to be able to do on transit. You would have a very hard time naming a major highway, freeway, road in this city that isn't just built, under construction now, in the planning stages, likely funded, like 360 and 183 North, that's about to be under its uh, construction. Or for example, major arterials like those we're improving over the next five years with our 2016 mobility bond. We are investing in the roads too. It's not an either or thing. We need it all. Our mobility challenges are so great. We cannot afford to have such 
narrow siloed thinking. We're the, the, the Texas Transportation Commission, which uh, you know the, the commissioner and the mayor joined up on and, and arguing for just a month ago, fully funded in their 10 year plan, uh, a project even more expensive than the Project Connect system. And that's finally getting the badly needed fixes on IH35. We are doing the roads, we're doing all the roads uh, and we need to do transit. So, so setting them up against each other is just not really a productive conversation because anybody who knows anything about mobility will tell you we need both of them and we are doing both of them. I'm John Michael, thanks so much. Guys, we're gonna, we're gonna come to the tail end here and I've got one question for you and then I want you to leave us with the remarks that you think are most important for our membership. Um, obviously, what, what is most top of mind for us is the impact to homeowners, the fact that this is a property tax burden and that it does directly impact our marketplace and affordability across Austin. We think that Austin is a place for everyone and we wanna do the best work we can to ensure that that is the case. So John Michael, you mentioned this is a, on average a $284 increase in homeownership. Um, the cost of owner, homeownership is rising in other ways. What is your overall perspective on, on the importance of that fact? And then don't forget to tell all of our members where they can learn more about your perspective and the campaign's perspective on the issue. And then Commissioner Dougherty will have the same with you in a moment. Well, you know, we recognize that this is a big investment. Again, it's a big investment because that's what the community wants. The community actually wants us to do something about all these challenges that we've talked about today. If we were trying to do another small one-off ad hoc solution, we would just get laughed out of the room because nobody would believe it would actually do anything. This is something that's big and bold because it has to be because the public actually wants us to solve the problems. But all that being said, we are talking about 78 cents a day for the median homeowner, 78 cents a day to get real solutions for traffic over the next couple of decades, to help us fight climate change, to improve equity and affordability, uh, to reduce traffic deaths, to create tens of thousands of jobs that will go to local people. There, there's so many positive things you know, we talk a lot about the cost of things. We don't talk enough about the value. What are we getting for this? And the reality is, is we're getting things, quite frankly, should have had 20 years ago, but we're finally doing the things we need to do to get them. And let me just dwell on, you know, one thing on affordability that, that I need to be mind, uh, remind everybody. The cost of housing, uh, you know, has seen an extraordinarily uh, dramatic rise uh, here in, in Austin and Travis County over the last several years. A lot of that, as, as this organization knows better than any, is driven by our inability to get the supply of housing we need on the ground. And I look forward to working with ABOR over the next several months to restart the conversations. By what the Austin Neighborhood Council says, we do need more housing, we need a new land development code, we're not gonna keep our heads stuck in the sand on mobility or affordability. But I do need to point out that for most families on average, after housing, which we hope is only 30% of their, their household costs, the next biggest line item on household budgets is transportation at around 20%, 17 to 20% for the average family. Low income and working class people, those essential workers that we rely on, get hit way harder by our inability to deliver affordable, accessible transit. Transportation costs, similar to taxes, are regressive. Wealthy households spend a small fraction of their household income on transportation. Lower income, working class, middle, middle uh, income households are spending dramatically more on transportation as part of their budget. Uh, Brookings uh, came out with a study a, a few years ago that in, uh, demonstrated in many major US metropolitan areas, lower and working class families are spending more on transportation than they are on housing. Think about that for a minute. Those are families who are not building wealth. They are throwing it away in car payments they can't afford, in fuel bills and maintenance bills, instead of building equity uh, in homes. Uh, neighborhoods that have access to the type of transit that will be provided through Project Connect are more affordable, not just from a transportation perspective, but the entire household budget. And we have to be focused on making living affordable in this city, in addition to just housing and transportation. So I think that for just 78 cents a day, we're actually gonna see a significant net benefit on, on housing and household affordability in this city as a result of this project. 
greater equity, cleaner air, a more livable city. And I hope you will all join me in voting for it uh, starting next week. You can go to transitnowatx.com and look at all the organizations in our city, almost all of them, save and except for the Travis County Republican Party and the Austin Neighborhoods Council, who have studied this and have endorsed this proposition because it's the right and long overdue thing. All right. All right, good. Thank you so much. Uh, Commissioner Dougherty, do you want to you want to wrap up with what how you what your perspective is on that impact to homeowners and where folks can go to learn more about the campaign that you've been participating in as well? Um, Emily, they can go to our mobility, our future dot com. Uh, it is a wonderful website. I think it's got a lot of great information in it. Some people want to take us to task over some of the points, but it's a, it's really something that you need to go to. In direct response to your question, Emily, you didn't write the piece in the paper just because they needed somebody to fill up some space. I mean, you wrote the piece in the paper because you know of the struggles that this community is having with affordability. People pay their homes and what they pay their homes off and what they're learning is their taxes on a yearly basis are more than their mortgages were. If this plan really, if I thought that this plan really had the ability to mitigate traffic and to do something about you know, perhaps the biggest issue that all of us have to deal with, and that is getting from point A to point B, I would be supportive of it. I would have been supportive of this a long time ago. People without means, I mean, the best thing they can have is the ability to go get a job. And how many people do you see of, you know, less means, you know, uh, that have to go to construction jobs, that have to go to do th things where they have to have an automobile in order to go do their job. Uh, those are the people that we know are going to do everything in their power to get a vehicle so that they, if they have to change jobs, if they have to go to a different part of town, they can, they can, they can do that. But Emily, here is the irrefutable truth about all of this. This is a huge tax burden with a roll the dice kind of a plan that there is no history whatsoever that says that people are going to miraculously going, that they're going to start using public transit. That is not the case. Technology is, I mean, in 20, 30, 40 years, like John Michael said, I mean, you know, we're building this plan for this. I mean, my God, I mean, by the time this plan is complete, it's obsolete. I mean, just look at what Uber Lyft, look at what, you know, technology has done for mobility. Between technology and then telework, we are going to see something different coming out of this pandemic. But the last thing that we need to do is stick our hand, head in the sand, sign off on an ever year increasing property tax from the city of Austin. And even though they want to continue to say it's only two, three percent, um, that is not something that this community can tolerate. I mean, we know that ACC will come at us for uh, another tax. We know that AISD will come at us with another bond. I mean, these are things that continue to grow uh, with regards to what the expectations and need and, and, and what we are trying to keep from happening. And that is, stop getting in my pocket. Live within your means. Take the penny sales tax and run the bus company and run it effectively and efficiently. Do not come to the taxpayers for some exorbitant ask when we all know, most of us know anyway, maybe not all, but most of us know, transit is not in a growth pattern. The other, the alternative things that are the growth patterns that we are witnessing. And a lot of the, most of those things 
are not something that we have to pay for with our tax dollars. This is a horrible plan at a horrible time, and we should vote no on November the 3rd and vote no starting next Tuesday at early vote. Thank you so much, Commissioner Darty. Thank you to both of you for joining us. As our members have heard, this is um, an issue with lots of nuances um, that people should consider as they head to the ballot box. Um, like Commissioner Darty said, next Tuesday, the start of early voting. Um, so thank you both for joining us. I know our members greatly appreciated hearing from both of you. Um, we posted the websites of both of um, the organizations that are um, represented here today in the chat box. So um, be sure to visit those to learn more about the stances of each of those groups. Um, I just wanna give you a quick few announcements as we head out um, today. Keep in mind, early voting starts next Tuesday. Be sure to get out the realtor vote. Um, the general election is on November 3rd and early voting runs from the 13th to the, I believe, 23rd. Am I getting that right, John Michael? The 30th. Starts next, starts next week. Yep, but when does it end? Uh, it's three weeks this year. Yes, yeah, so the 30th. The 30th. Yeah, the 30th. Yeah. Sorry, y'all. That's embarrassing. Um, so keep an eye out for ABOR's voter Not guide. Not embarrassing. They keep changing it, Jenny. So. I know. Well, they keep yeah. changing Give stuff. So, yeah. Keep an eye out for ABOR's voting guide, which will be released soon and give you all the information you need to know as you head to the ballot box. Um, also, we have our volunteer call going on right now. We have policy teams that are available for you to sign up for if you're interested in policy issues like this one. We will be discussing those all year long and you can join one of those groups. We have an upcoming tree pack event, which is a really fun social networking event on October 22nd. Visit abor.com slash cupcakes to learn more about our cupcakes and cocktails event um, and to register today. Finally, we have a speaker series coming up. We will be um, hearing from Daryl Davis on October 15th that will be focusing on how to increase your listing inventory now. Um, so you can register online for that at abor.com slash speaker series. And before you head out, be sure to um, fill out that excellent survey you get for attending today. We wanna hear from you about how you enjoyed this um, panel and so that we can bring you more quality programming in the future. Thanks again for joining us um, and for hearing both sides. I hope you um, got a lot out of it and we'll see you very soon. Thanks so much guys. We'll see you soon.